In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. First of all, St Peter. If uh, you were a group of primary school children here from the local school, I'm sure there would have been one nearby uh, ere long. Um, I would have asked you, as I have done at St Andrews in uh, Bramfield uh, not too long ago, uh, ask the children, how can we tell this church is dedicated to St Peter? Anybody got any ideas of uh, how we could tell this church was dedicated to St Peter? Any ideas? It says on the board outside, excellent. And uh, yes, somebody else? Our keys, keys on that uh, sort of shepherd's crook come P initial uh, in the centre of our red altar frontal. Exactly right. Um, sometimes churches will have their patron um, either side of uh, a Jesus being crucified in the middle, but we're a rather lower church, although we've nearly got um, the seven lights of the world on the rear of us. Um, the east window is actually relatively low. And this tradition would be a, crucified, a crucifixion in the centre panel and uh, John and Mary on either side. And we've got uh, Mary and Miriam even playing a tambourine, Keith. There you are, there's something to aspire to. <laughs> yes, we've got the crossed keys. And that is because uh, traditionally the interpretation of uh, what's presented to us as this exchange between Jesus and the disciples includes um, Jesus saying to Peter... Um, or apparently to Peter, um, I will give you the keys of a kingdom. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, which is possibly where we get the idea that we will meet Peter at the pearly gates. He also says, um, blessed are you, um, I will, on this rock, I will build my church. That's why he started to call Simon Peter, or Rocky, the rock. Uh, my own view is that um, the word rock happens throughout scripture to mean God's plan of restoration and making us fully ourselves or salvation or whatever you would like to call it but the rock is code for God's plan of redemption and restoration so I tend to read this as being you're blessed because you recognize that I am Jesus the answer to uh, God's plan of salvation the rock uh, blessed is the one who builds their house on stone uh, intriguingly we've just discovered St Mary's Halesworth is built on sand which might not be a good thing theologically, but it's very good in terms of drainage. <laughs> but perhaps more importantly than all that, as the opening exchanges where Jesus asks uh, those who are around him, the disciples, the apostles, it says disciples here, that might be the 12, it might be various other uh, women in addition, it might be other people too. The words disciples and apostles is slightly interchangeable. And he's asking the crowd with him, who aren't just sort of the crowd following, but this is a group of uh, sort of closer followers, disciples or apostles. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So Jesus called himself the Son of Man, as a, again a kind of code that opens up the possibility for us to have discussion about what that means. Whereas if he just said, I am the Saviour, I am God's answer to all your problems, I am the silver bullet, we wouldn't have those conversations. Who do people say that the Son of Man is. Even that question wouldn't make sense if Jesus said, who do people say the Saviour is? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then there's a list, some John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, and we could talk about each of those in turn. But perhaps this morning we might think to ourselves, who do people think will be their Saviour? Rishi Sunak? Keir Starmer, whoever else, Adrian Ramsey, Nigel Farage, are they the Messiah? Will they cure all our ills? We may laugh, but we've put ourselves into this situation. These are the people who will represent what was once and may still be and could be in the future a country that was called Great Britain by those who knew us overseas, and now, sadly, we're a laughing stock, at best, and at worst, complicit in one of the worst uh, military situations 
that we've seen probably ever in the history of the planet. But who do people say that the Son of Man is more locally? Another way of putting that is what do people put their trust in over and against politicians? We've sort of dismissed them. Do we uh, submit ourselves to gong bathing, forest bathing? Do we run everywhere? Do we switch off our tellies? Slightly facetiously, um, I saw recently on uh, social media a photograph of a bit of a shell um, that had um, been involved in killing some people somewhere, and it had on the bottom an American, the name of an American company, Hollywell. And Liz said, oh, um, I think uh, our central heating um, was manufactured by that company, so I wondered whether I should uh, switch it all off and not, not put it on in uh, revolt at uh, what their company has been involved with. <coughs> but who do people... What do people put their trust and faith in, in our day? Model railways, wine, drugs, gambling, hatred of the other. Jesus doesn't respond. He just goes on, but who do you say that I am? And maybe that's as important as the first question. What do people we come into contact think about the future, about spirituality, about uh, the answer to all the problems that we face. What are the questions? Jesus then goes on to say, but what about you? You are my people. You are gathered around me. We have had some experience. You've had some religious experience. You may not necessarily speak in tongues, but you might sit in a church and think, my goodness, what a wonderful building this is. I can't really explain why, but I come here more often than I might otherwise. I don't really understand, but something about me is me because I am here. Who do you say that I am? What is that experience that makes you that has brought you here even this morning? Interest, faith, desperation, spirituality. Do you see something in the red altar front with the cross keys and the P? Do you see something in uh, that shepherd in the middle section there who uh, actually was an artisan that uh, he could find space among his blistered hands to carry that little sheep, which may be me, it may be you. Reminds me of the Holman Hunt image of uh, Jesus knocking on the door without a handle. Recognising that it's entirely down to us how we engage with the offer of God in that once dead Jew, who incidentally was a Syrian from Palestine. He may have died younger if he'd been born 2,000 years later. Who do you say that I am? And Peter who um, obviously had been to Bible college, says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, quite right, good work, sunshine. I'll call you Rocky from now on. Would Jesus say the same thing of us if we were in a pub, on a bus, asked by our granddaughter, what's all this about? And I'll come back to the closing lines of our gospel reading. But I did just want to comment on our um, epistle from First Peter. I think we need to recognise the context in which this letter was written, which was one of persecution. People thought they were doing the right thing by coming to faith, but things weren't going well for them. They were being persecuted and they're uh, being tortured and imprisoned, excluded, berated, because they said that Jesus was God and not Caesar. They said that Jesus was uh, Messiah and uh, not John the Baptist or not somebody yet to come. One way or another, the early church was persecuted and excluded, which is why I think we have so much in the earliest writings, so the epistles were in fact written before the Gospels, saying it's okay to suffer. Now, sadly, we have tended to interpret that, particularly the higher church amongst us, as being we really should be suffering, otherwise we're not doing our job properly. And sometimes you might hear somebody, if you follow one of these great missionary organisations like Mission Aviation Fellowship, for example, you might find on page, I don't know, 12, somebody saying, we knew we were doing God's work because everything fell into place. But then five or six pages later, or in a different journal, you might read, we knew we were doing God's work because it was really difficult all the way. So you pay your money, you take your choice. But what I wouldn't want us to take away from this passage is that Christianity is based on the idea of a parent abusing their child and enjoying it, and in enjoying it so much, we're all free 
to abuse ourselves and others because that is what Christian faith is all about. I tend to look at much of our scripture as being metaphorical. I also recognise why we call God the source, the impossible, unknowable father. And I also know why we sometimes talk about Jesus as, as being the son. But if not for us, there are many we live amongst for whom the image of persecution is unhelpful at best. This may help us if we have been in that situation of abuse to recognise whilst it's not okay, God does understand. Being tortured to death is not okay, but someone has gone there before and it will work out right. We might die in pain, that is not okay, but God has already been there and done that so we'll be in that situation with us, as we were in his situation when he died on the tree, mocked, humiliated and excluded. If we remember that Jesus is God, that might help us understand that it is not okay for a parent to abuse a child, even by telling them they should do something they don't want to do, because according to their faith, that's right. Female genital mutilation, for example. I think that what we should take from this is that Jesus is God. God has submitted God's self to the worst that humanity can throw at them. So that we recognise that, that has been broken through, done away with, overthrown. That in fact justice and peace, <coughs> healing and hope, honour of children and of the abused and the excluded is actually the truest expression of the Christian faith. And victory over those things rather than acceptance and submission to them and of them. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls, minds, bodies and strength. And so to conclude, as we look for God's salvation for us, for our community, our nation and our world, and for the creation on which we depend if we know and understand in some small measure some of what we have heard from uh, Peter and some of what we have gained from our experience of worshipping together this morning, we might be able to scratch the surface of what it means to have been given the keys of the kingdom. And if we go out from here thinking we are not going to tolerate this any longer and we bind those things on earth, they will be bound in heaven. The earth is a an image of the reality that is above, according to the writers here. Their worldview is that we are living in an image of the reality. God's real throne room is in heaven. God's real temple is in heaven. We are just an image. When we are resurrected, we will be our true selves here. We're just a shadow. If we bind something here, it will be backed up. It's a little bit like as children we might have said, oh, my daddy is bigger than your daddy. What we say will be backed up by the powers and principalities Whatever we loose on earth, love, joy, hope, peace, restoration, acceptance, welcome, that will be backed up in heaven by God, by Peter, however we understand, whoever we understand holds those keys. They will unlock on our behalf and back up the people we are and the stand we take in and for Jesus as we understand him to be the Messiah, the son of the living God. Amen.